Hello? Hello. <laughs> so, you are? I'm Chris Wafer, bass player. All right. Any opening statements? How are you today? Good. Really looking forward to not say I've been recording for 10 months. Really looking forward ten to months. Has it been 10 months already? We started in January. We restarted in June. So, and now it's October. So, uh, tell me a little bit about the recording process for Enjoy the Ridge. Uh, well, uh, it's kind of two-sided, like side A, side B. Side A was from January until June, where we kind of figured out how to not do a lot of stuff and how to do stuff right, uh, which was a really important uh, aspect of the recording process, because, you know, if we went back and listened to our first stuff, it was not that the notes were wrong or the rhythm was wrong, but it was just the sound quality was really poor. Uh, and we didn't really know what we were doing, we thought we did. I'm sure I'll say in another 10 months, we had no idea what we were doing back then, just being that this time period. Uh, but we weren't really sure how we were doing stuff. We were kind of taking a lot of shortcuts that weren't necessarily good, but we learned what made it, it not sound right and how to make it sound right. Uh, and then side B <clears throat> was just know, more along the lines of uh, like grip it and rip it um, because we knew what we knew how to get the sound that we wanted and we knew why we were getting that way and we knew the whole background of it but it was just the matter of fact of you, know, you can play a song a thousand times and never play it right but when you sit down to record it it has to be played right uh, and there's no ifs ands or buts like any mistake you'll hear for the rest of your life on a recording so. The aspect of side B that was very challenging was playing everything right, uh, or getting it all in a close enough way that when we got it here, it would be manageable. Um, and that's how we kind of learned through side A how to do that. And right. Side B was the process of doing it. So, I mean, did you enjoy the process being entirely at home? I know you took on a lot of the technical aspects. Yeah, I mean. <clears throat> From the, the aspect of where I am now, both in the band-wise and, I guess, career-wise, what I have is a career, uh, but with, like, radio and doing sound, there's no way I'd be able to understand, you know, even a third or a quarter of what I understand now with EQing and panning and levels and, and frequency crossovers and everything. Uh, I understand a lot more of it now. Sorry, what was the question again? I mean, just if you enjoyed recording. Oh, I enjoyed it. Um, I certainly enjoyed it. Uh, from about August on, I started getting pretty tired of it because it was the same songs for the last you know, 10 months or at that point, you know, eight months. Uh, and I knew what it should sound like in my head, and it was just a matter of getting it onto the computer, which took, not that it took long, it took as long as it needed to take, but the fact that we couldn't devote all of our time to it, that we all had, you know, the five of us each have, you know, the band life, you know, your professional life and then your personal life, and to have all three of those line up the same and then have five members within that band to have everything line up the same, like to have 15 factors all be perfectly lined up, it's just difficult. Uh, so, you know, we'd go into these weekends and have just a ton of recording, uh, which went really well. It was always, to a degree, a lot of fun, you know, it was the fun side of work, um, but it, it was it was just tough because it, it took longer than I wanted to wanted it to take. Like, if we had been able to devote like four weeks straight, we would have been able to do it in a month. But we had to then spread that out over ten months, which was tough. And like certain songs, I don't even want to listen to anymore. Like I can't. I don't even like. I mean, I still like Scratch, but I don't even like want to listen to it anymore. Like it's like a. a heard that bass line and I've heard those piano parts and those vocal harmonies and just everything so many times. I'm sure in a month I'll love the song, but right now I don't even want to hear it ever again. Um, I'm sure that'll only become more evident through the, the mastering process because you, you have to listen to the song like 10 times in a row, 15 times in a row. It's just, it's tough. But yes, I did. It's I enjoyed the process and I think the final product will be worth all the effort. Final product, Enjoy the Ridge. Enjoy the Ridge. Why uh, Why is it called Enjoy the Ridge? Uh, well, we live on Ridge Ave, or 
part of the band lives on Ridge Ave. We, the band practices at Ridge, uh, and, and Septibuses love driving up and down the Ridge, uh, and, and you know, just everything that kind of has a dealing with her, like anything. How do I how can I say this? Everything that is on this album has always you know, had breaks or pauses in it to go enjoy the ridge. And that just kind of became a term that is, I don't know, I guess what, we have a lot of different language, uh, or at least, you know, abbreviations for stuff, or, you know, certain words mean something else. And it was just like, you know, let's go take a break and enjoy the ridge, uh, go outside and get some fresh air and watch the septipuses go by. and. Uh, that became, you know, where we could always talk about stuff, and it was kind of, I guess, a safe place, because it was, you know, when you're in in the house or you're in the recording area or doing whatever, it was like you had to deal with what was on hand and what was at hand, and you couldn't really, and you talked about it to a degree, but when you went out to enjoy the ridge, you discussed it, which was very different than just talking about it, uh, and so we got a lot of ideas or you know, brainstorming or whatever was that occurred during Enjoy the Ridge sessions. Um, and then we kind of said it as a joke, and then it kind of stuck, and then we all started liking it, and then I think the final step was Wiz came around to it. And that's when we were like, okay, this can be called Enjoy the Ridge. Because that's, and oh, well, the Enjoy the Ridge phrase started on a, it was a banner on like a, a telephone pole. And it was like, you know, the Roxborough gazebo, and it said Enjoy the Ridge. And we just thought that was the most ridiculous thing ever. Because like the next one said Roxboro, fun, family, which is even more ridiculous. So it was just kind of like a joke that turned into meaning a lot more, I guess. Right on. All right, so let's start going through some of the songs that will be on Enjoy the Ridge. Yeah. Um, just a couple lines, one or two. Yeah. Tell me about uh, Creepy. I'm looking at all the other four members of the band right now. I enjoy the track, it's probably my least favorite on the album. Uh, just in the sense that there's so much dissonance to it. Uh, and I'm, you know, I was based, I grew up listening to pop music and pop rock and, you know, I'm sure in 30 years I'll be much more like my dad and, and listening to more of the pop rock side of things. But it's just, it's so, it's so weird. It's so <laughs> weird. Uh, and, but I will say it has the best closing of any of the songs that we have. And I think the way that it was recorded and the way that it will turn up on the album, I don't see it anywhere else other than a closing track because it's like, it does that And I just think that's like a really, the way that that happened, however it happened, I know all the recording sessions kind of all just became one big blob in my, my mind of just like, oh, I gotta deal with this. Um, it's weird. It's a weird track. So weird, which isn't. I think about, my, my uh, two words are weird and normal. What I used to describe music. All right. How about a state line? State line. Since we're still kind of in the process of it, that was actually. That was the most. The most coolest. That was the coolest track for me, because I actually worked a lot with Brendan on that one, uh, and we really combined notes and rhythm. And I was actually just thinking about this the other day. You know, <laughs> whoever out there might disagree, I think I have a pretty good understanding of notes. Sometimes it takes me a little bit longer than it probably should. Sometimes it happens faster than it should. Um, but rhythm has always probably been my biggest leap that I need to take uh, in, in becoming a better bass player. And working with Brendan on that really combined someone who knew rhythm way better than I do, and I think I had a really good grasp of the notes I wanted to play and how to play those notes, and then we kind of combined efforts on that. And, you know, that took like two or three hours, but I think the final product was way better than if you had given me ten years to be able to record that song. Like, I don't, I don't think it would come out any better than it did. Um, wow. And that's, I mean, that's more specifically on the bass side of things, uh, but it's still a really great song. And uh, I guess that's 
that's that's my main understanding of that song is the amount that I got to work with Brendan on that, and that was really cool. All right. I mean, just a side note then. I mean, obviously you being in the quote, rhythm section. Rhythm section. Do you think that like the recording process and all the technical aspects that you took on also made you a better musician? Uh, it was a well, basically the question was was it purely technical or are you like applying it to like when you play? Oh it? yeah, like I I in the past ten months. I don't want to say I've learned how to play drums, but I can be I can pass as a probably a really simple pop rock drummer. Like I can make it probably happen. Uh, and ten months ago, you know, I couldn't do anything. But that's also just from watching Brendan and trying to understand more. So yeah, I mean, I paid a lot more attention to what was going on ryth rhythmically. Um, of course, certain parts on all the other songs or all the songs combined, I needed. I don't want to say help, but a group effort um, to make something that's probably pretty good into something that's really fucking good. Um, and I won't, I'm not going to curse that much during this because I want my curses to be emphasized. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I definitely, you know, in two months I'll say I'm better than I was now. And, and that's one of the cool things of, of playing music. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, but hands down, I, I step, I don't want to say, I step back. I thought a lot about I thought a lot more about every note I played and why I was playing it, certainly to some degree on some songs way more than on others, um, but the, the parts where I really concentrated on and when I came out of it, I think that there was something really strong there that would not have ever happened, you know, working with anyone else or doing anything else with anyone else. Nice. All right, uh, back to the songs then. Yeah. How about, um, that's what Bees said. Still, that... I will say it's now no longer new, new in my mind. I always think of that's what B said. Uh, that was the, the first one we did upstairs in like the, the second part B of our recording. Uh, and the overall process was really cool. And that was the first time I spent a lot of time thinking more about the tone that I was going for and maybe playing a certain note higher up on the A string on the neck than jumping to the D string because it just didn't sound right. And yes, they were the same note, but there was like night and day compared uh, comparatively. And the first time I went through that song on side A of recording, uh, I did not take that into account, and I got really mad about it because all these notes that I not all that I wasn't mad, but I was upset with. I didn't know how to figure out the uh, the process to it. Um, but then on coming towards side B, I thought about it a lot more, and uh, and just kind of I don't know thinking about a lot of just thinking about the song as a whole, I certainly started off playing a lot more notes, and I, know, I tend, I don't know, I don't tend to do that, but I tend to not ever stay with what I first write for a song, um, and that was very evident, because I, I don't remember who, it was either Wiz or Kevin, they're like, yeah, you don't need that many notes, just like slide it, and that slide distortion will sound great, and I did that, I was like, oh yeah, so that just helped me understand the overall logic of how they got to where they did, which then makes my, you know, glossary that much bigger. Right on. Well, that makes sense. Anything stand out about, um, Climb of Tears? Um, that was actually another Brendan wafer combo that we spent like three hours in the basement. I was trying different tunings, trying, you know, putting foam under the strings, uh, playing with the pick, playing with fingers, playing with the you know, picking fingers in different spots on, on the body, uh, and just really just tearing apart my tone, which is something I always thought I had done, but I'd never done it with someone else, so I only had my own perceptions of what was happening, and to have someone else there being like, the fuck are you doing, it was an, an eye-opening <laughs> experience, uh, and just, you know, it helped me understand a lot more, uh, but man, that song from start to finish had probably the most changes in what I did. This most alternate, like, you know, playing 16th notes or playing quarter notes or playing a quarter note with an octave or, you know, playing a fifth, like, it just, it went through the most changes. And, like, you know, we were like, okay, this is the way it's going to be. And then going back and be like, no. Like, it now has to change again. And fortunately, I was able to just carry things over from previous takes so I didn't have to completely redo a lot of stuff that we had done, that Brendan and I had done on, like, the first time through. Um, what else about Clown's Tears? 
recording that freaking descent was probably the biggest pain in the ass. Because like the first time we did it, Brandon didn't start clicking his drumsticks right away, and then uh, it just something fell apart somewhere in there with the ghost, the ghost guitar, tra um, scratch guitar, and it just it all fell apart. And the second time through, we had learned how to not do it, which was pretty important. And uh, it just went a lot smoother. It was actually the first one that we mixed here. And after the first run through, it was like these things needed to be changed. By the second run through, it's, I mean, it's pretty much done. It's pretty much ready. So I guess that's the closest thing that I've heard to a final track so far. It's nice. As creepy as to the end, climate tears to the beginning. I don't see it anywhere else. And have it be appropriate. Even if it does end up somewhere else, it's still. <laughs> okay. How about uh, OT5? That wins the biggest pain in the ass award, for sure. Um, just the amount of layers that we have in it, and we had violin, we had flute at one point, we had like a flute arrangement on the piano at one point, we had piano, we had electronic piano versus stand-up piano, I had distorted bass, clean bass, you know, a bunch of rhythm guitar, like five vocal tracks with harmonies. Just epic. It was such a undertaking. Uh, and to hear the mix down done tonight is all worth it. So that song, it's all worth it. I cheers to it being all worth it. Okay. <laughs> How about uh, Wives Tale? Originally, there was two tracks that we had gotten from Kevin that were slow. Slow. Um, one was Wives Tale's Wives Tale, and one was Whatever She Likes. I always like Wives Tale way more than Whatever She Likes. Not that why, in comparison, I like the other. Uh, as independent features, they're both really great songs. Um, but I just felt like Wives Tale was a stronger song with a really great, just everything. The structure was great, the chord progression was really great, how Kevin wrote it. I actually remember Kevin wrote that at Sheldon Street. Uh, and like I watched him play it, and then I started playing. I was like, man, this is really great. And Wiz walked in and was like, holy crap, Wave, like, what'd you write? And I was like, not mine. <laughs> and from that moment on, I just always really liked that song. And that was another one that went through a lot of bass changes. And it ended up being, Kevin wrote the line and then I recorded it. Um, it's because it was a pain in the ass. He had to write it on a different bass because the P bass action was too high. Uh, I then had to record it on the P bass action, which was, action is the elevation of the strings. And that was, Pain in the ass, to say the least. That was that and scratch had the most bass cuts, which were things I had to move, you know, a centimeter to get it on time. And you know, I was still recording it four or five times before I was like, screw that, I'm just gonna move it. Um, but it's it's a really like I don't want to say beautiful. There's probably some other term that's out there that's better, but it's just a beautiful song, and it really just goes. Perfectly. Like, I remember when Kevin, Ke I recorded Kevin's solos on it. This is the one of the, the times that stick out in my memory of recording. Not many. But I remember when Kev, I think we spent probably like a half an hour in the basement recording his two solos. And after he did the first one, I was like, holy crap, like, we're not recording that again. We're not doing anything to it. Like, that's perfect. Same with the second solo. And I was like, and that's, you know, and that's, and that's. That's that. And that's that. All right. A couple more. Um, anything that stood out about Escalation? Um, other than the, the two loud parts, which I, uh, you would spell two as T-O-O, -O, um, that Wiz did were deafening. And I was in the basement for like an hour. That's one of the other ones. I remember, I think that, oh no, that was creepy, but we did creepy and escalation parts at the same time, and it was just, like I had my earplugs in, it was still hurting my ears. But that was also the track where I recorded distorted bass and clean bass at the same time so I could merge them together so I could get the distorted sound, but have the crispness, crispness of the notes being clean, uh, and then merging them together, uh, which I had never done and I would never really thought of before. And I ended up one late night, I was like, you know, watching TV. I was like, oh, I should do that. Because I was having a really hard time getting a heavy distortion 
and having the definition of the notes still being there. And I was like, well, I can do the base DI and then do the distorted one through the, the Tascam or the Apogee or whatever we were using at the time. And I was like, I think that'll work. And that was a cool little, just a click, you know, another step in understanding music and the whole yeah, process. Definitely. And I uh, thought that was pretty cool. I enjoyed that experience. Good. More here, Hi Fi Glasses Crush. Uh, that was another one that uh, went through some changes. The end that actually started was because Brendan was recording me. Uh, and uh, he's like, Yeah, there, there should be something else there. I'm like, I don't know. Like, I think it's supposed to be simple here because that was when I was still in the mind frame of like, I play too many notes. Uh, I should really step back from that and let the song breathe. And I always thought the vocals on that song were really important. I didn't want to ever cloud them. Uh, but then we ended up doing that, and then like Kev came down because we got stuck on one part, and then Kev and I kind of kept writing together, and then we kind of bounced a bunch of ideas back and forth, and then in the end, it, you know, that's one of my more favorite songs to play live now, just because I love the, the way the bass ended up coming up. And that was really like, you know, Brendan on the rhythm, me on notes and some rhythm, and then Kevin being in the middle uh, and having the notes and the rhythm and all of us coming together to create like the ultimate super group bass line. Uh, that was really cool. And then doing the group vocals was a lot of fun. I mean, I'm really interested to see how that turns out. That, I mean, it must have been really cool to have like so many people and friends yeah. involved. In well, the, the fun thing, I would say there was like 40 people there. I don't even know if there was, because uh, I was downstairs in the basement recording. Um, but the one thing that I think is going to be really cool is that you know we take that one track copy and paste it, move a little bit forward, copy and paste it, and then move it back to the original, and then a little bit back, and then that 40 people becomes, what is it, 120 people. And I just think mm, it's pretty limitless. What Wait, do with that. you got your sports tip on your uh, what's the score? Three to one wins? Fuck's sake. Sorry, let you know. <laughs> <laughs> what a depressing interruption. <laughs> he interrupted the interview to tell you that the Yankees are losing. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did the Phils win? Did they play today? They, they, they played tomorrow. They lost yesterday, so it's 1 1. The Yankees dominated yesterday, so. Mm -hmm. It's sad. Um, but yeah, that's kind of everything on that song. Everything that you know, really stands out. I'm sorry about the Yankees. We'll hey, keep it's, not, it's not over yet. We'll it's keep probably it like the 8th now, though. 8th or ninth, easily. I can tell you right now if you want. I'll look it up for you, and while I do that, why don't you tell me about the silences on? That freaking song has been around since sophomore year, so it was that, 05, and now it's 09. Uh, that song was pretty harmless. That was another Brennan recording me. I guess he recorded me more than anyone. Uh, not that, that bad. It just helped to have the drummer there because then you're really able to lock up. Since we weren't able to record together, to have, I guess, me record you and then you record me really helped us understand everything. I'll know from off screen that Brendan is sitting next to me. <laughs> um, the viewer will know. Uh, but that song, I don't know, I'd written that, I wrote that bass line when I was a sophomore and I asked Wiz, I was like, Wiz, bring your acoustic guitar in here, play D and G over again, and then stop me when you hear something you like. He stopped me and I had no idea what I had played, and then we had to refigure out how we played it. So that was a cool you know, four years ago thing about that song. Um, no, I, it's just, it's been around for forever, so, I don't know. I don't have much to say about that song. That pretty much wraps up the, uh, the songs. songs, unless you'd like that. We've, I mean, we've mentioned Scratch yeah, a couple scratch. Of times now, unless you want to throw anything else in there uh, Scratch. Wish I had never had that drunken practice with Dan and Dan. <laughs> and that's so not true, but very true. That song has been the biggest pain in my ass lately. Um, Next. A few more questions here. Uh, what do you think about? Right now? Yeah. How much I want to steal that bass and bring it home with me. Which is a nice little semi, looks like the Hoffner Club bass. And uh, I believe it's a K bass, which is probably not very good. But I uh, <laughs> keep going back and playing it and fiddling with it. 
and uh, I'd really love to bring it home because it's really cool. And this is it. So Chris, you stole it, good for you, <laughs> but probably don't. And I don't know, it's really cool. Is that the one that makes that noise? But like, it... a lot tonight so far. And that stupid six string in there that I'd rather kill six myself string. than play. Okay. A couple more questions. Yeah, shoot away. I got answers. Do a few rapid fire questions now. Which uh your favorite venue to play? None of them are that great. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know them really. They all kind of pretty standard. I know we haven't played there yet, but I'm really looking forward to playing Blockley. Blockley Poorhouse, which is a new. Some of us work there. Uh, I think that's going to be a really fun venue. Uh, as much as I hate the North Star, uh, what's the North Star's sound guy's name? Not Andrew. Steve. I think it's Steve. Yeah. Kevin, you don't know. Uh, but by far, he's been the sound guy that's cared the most about our sound. Um, but most places are just really lazy. And now I can say I can probably do a better job than them. Uh, or at least I'll care more. I don't know. They, they probably know more than me, but you know, I, I make an effort to care. And uh, the fact that you know, eight venues out of ten, you can never hear comedy, I just think is unacceptable. Without a, without a favorite venue, do you have one show that sort of stands out as like a favorite live performance? really like the piano show a lot. Um, that was one of the venues that the sound guy just killed it. Uh, I don't know if we killed it as a band. Uh, we certainly had some fun there. Uh, but that was like, that was the first show that like this band as itself really traveled together. We had a lot of new material at the time, material at the time. And it was one thing that I that I've lost in this whole recording process is the fun that I have playing live, and I think that's one part of this band that's gone into a little bit of hibernation right now, which it had to do, you know, as everything goes and, and shifts and movements. But uh, that was just a really fun show, and that's I'm really looking forward to getting back and writing new music and playing shows again. As much as I hate moving equipment. I will look forward to that as well. <laughs> All right. One sentence, maybe two if you have to. Using no words. So Tell me about Dan Wiz. Best friend who's better at making music than me that I'll stay with as long as he keeps playing music. Tell me about Dan Connolly. Newer friend, newer. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of the band, of how long, you know, like since he's been with us. I don't know how he does what he does, but he can make the saddest freaking D minor chord <laughs> progression, like the happiest pop song on the face of the planet, and I don't understand how he does it, and he continues to really just blow me away. I don't know where it comes from, but it, it just, like, especially the stuff he did on the French Rapture, or French, French Rapture, it's going to be renamed, I think, although Wiz said he's, he's writing lyrics for the French Rapture. I don't know, I was really fucked up when I thought that name up and I thought it was funny. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I came in with the bass line on that song, and he wrote the chorus or the verse or whatever, and I was like, where did you come up with that? And his piano part, oh god, what song is it? But that, ba -na -na, ba -na -na, ba -na -na. Maybe it's Scratch? It is yeah, Scratch. That's, that's like the coolest fucking piano line I've ever heard. So. 
I've thoroughly enjoyed playing music with him over the last two years. Dan Conley. Tell me about Kevin Ryan. It's fucking perfect pitch. I tell ya. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. It is the best thing on the face of the planet. And sometimes I want to knock him in the face. Because I know that I'll eventually get to the note and I know what's wrong. And like I see him glance over at me, I'm like, I know, I know, I know. Um, but hands down, he's just a musician. And he's really fucking good at it. And you know, he's another one that I just, I don't know how he thinks. I'm sure he doesn't know how I think. But it, it works really well for some reason. If you pretend he wasn't sitting here, tell me a little bit about Brennan Lafferty. First, I thought he was a dick. <laughs> Because uh, he came up to me at Tin Angel, and I had gotten off stage and proceeded, I think I'm, because some of my friends were there, and they just, I just did a lot of shots. And then he comes up to me, he's like, I'm going to be your next drummer. And I was like, that area, fuck. I'm like, really? I'm like, really? You know, we're pretty good. Of course, being in my drunk mind frame. Uh, and then I kind of thought about it more, and like that's what Keith Moon did when he went up to The Who. And The Who is, you know, one of my favorite bands since freshman year of high school. So then I was like, yeah, it's pretty bold. I like it. And, you know, I met him, uh, started hanging out more, started writing music. And I don't want to say you're rusty at all when you first started playing, but the lengths that you've grown in the last year are really great. And that stuff you're writing on Kev's new one, Rainbow Grout. <laughs> uh, like, I, I would have never thought about it in a million years. And... And I think that's just one of the reasons we're, we work as a rhythm section is that we both think very differently. And a lot of the times it works together. And whenever it doesn't, we work it out. So that's really cool. Something I didn't have with the previous drill. Yeah. You can edit that last part out. It doesn't need to be in there. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Why are you yelling? Why am I yelling? Am I yelling? <laughs> it's written down here. Yeah. I take these questions very seriously. <laughs> I have to ask them all. All right. Rapid fire questions. I'll Everyone's going to have to do this. this time. Well, you have to. Okay. Apples or oranges? Oranges. Stones or Beatles? Beatles. Apple or Windows? Apple. Ford or Chevy? Ford. Walmart or Target? Target. Pats or Geno's? Pats. Starburst or Skittles? Neither. Stripes or polka dots? Stripes. Jeans or khakis? Jeans. Markers or colored pencils? Both. Rowboat or sailboat? Neither. City or country? City. Beach or mountains? Both. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Pepsi or Coke? Yes. Shoes or sneakers? Sneakers. Batman or Superman? Batman. Kindergarten cop or cop and a half? Kindergarten cop. Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> and what's next for the quill source? The future. I don't know. Um, that was awesome. We should have just ended it right there. <laughs> that yeah, yeah, you re-ask that, that question. You're done. Re -ask that question. Well, what's next for the quell source? The future. That's not as good. <laughs> <laughs> that should be it. That's, that'll be how it ends. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> you know, the future. No, it's not as good. <laughs> Blank screen. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's, that's how the whole DVD will end. <laughs> the future. That's <laughs> That'll be the menu. That was future. that was a that was a rapid the future. Fire answer. No, that's not as good. The that, was, that was that was that was immediate. Really, I don't know that, that was good. Mean. That was good. All right. Profound. Chris Wafer. I'm out. Yeah.